hello, Brother Barry Scott. Uh, Sunday mornings with Brother Barry as I'm loving uh, to preach. Uh, do you know among all the parables that Jesus told, uh, which one was the last parable? Well, that's the one I'm going to preach on today. Uh, it's found uh, at least in one of the versions, Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. It's often called uh, the parable of the wicked uh, tenants or farmers. Uh, but he told this the final week before he went to the cross. Now, it is a wonderful parable that has great debt. Uh, and in some ways, it summarizes the entire Old Testament and New Testament. I have entitled today's message, The Claim, The Claim. And reading from Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all saying, surely they will respect my son. But the farmers said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. There's a wonderful old story about a very wealthy man who had two great passions, two great loves in his life. Uh, because of his wealth, uh, he was able to assemble a great collection of fine art, many masterpieces. Uh, there in his large home, he had a room dedicated to the art. Now, the man also had another great love, his one and only son, his wife and the boy's mother had died uh, in childbirth. Uh, his son had grown to a very fine young man. Uh, he was the pride and joy of the owner. He loved him so much. But it was wartime. And the young man had come of age and he felt like he should do his duty and his father agreed. And so he enlisted and soon was sent overseas to be involved in battle. Uh, the father was very, very grieved about his son, even though he understood and knew it was the right thing to do. But... One day, his servant brought him a telegram. It read, sadly, his son was missing in action and perhaps presumed lost or dead. This was a great sadness to the father and to the servant. About three more months went by. There was a knock at the door. And when the servant opened, there stood a uniformed officer, a chaplain. And yes, it was true. The owner's son had perished in battle. How heartbreaking. The old father was brokenhearted. 
Uh, about a year went by and there was another knock at the door and this time it, it was another young man also in uniform. He introduced himself and told that he had served in the same company as the man's son. In fact, they had been uh, buddies and he shared with the father uh, how his son had met a heroic death and this was great comfort to the father, but then he had something more. He reached into his backpack, took out a rolled piece of paper and unfolded it and when he did, uh, it was a charcoal likeness of the owner's son. The young soldier explained that they'd had a street artist do that as they were moving across uh, France and stationed for a little while in Paris. He presented it to the father and he was greatly thrilled. He thanked the young man. Oh, how he cherished that picture. Now, it wasn't by any means an art masterpiece like so many he had but of course it had great meaning to him and he had it framed and put in a position of prominence among all his other great artworks. A couple of years went by and the father, the owner himself, died, many thought, because of a broken heart. He'd never been able to get over his son. It was announced that because there were really no living relatives, that according to the man's will, there would be an auction and all his wonderful collection of art would be auctioned off. That attracted a great crowd of uh, people. The auction began and the auctioneer said, now according to the owner's will, there is one piece of art, one painting that must be sold before anything else can be bid on. And he had brought forth that charcoal picture of the son. Well, it really had no value other to the father. That wasn't what people had come to, to bid on. And, and, and so uh, there was silence. No one proposed a bid. In the back of the room was the old servant who dearly loved uh, that man and dearly had loved the son, had uh, actually helped to raise him. He couldn't bear the thought uh, that nobody was bidding on the son's picture. And even though he had never done so before, very timidly uh, he looked in his billfold and he got what little money he had, which wasn't a lot, and he raised his hand and he made that bid. There were no other bids. The gavel was brought down, sold to that man in the back. And then the auctioneer had a startling example. He said, this auction is now closed. And he went on to reveal that whosoever had loved the owner's son enough to bid on his picture, not only got the picture, but he got everything else that the owner had ever had. Surely, they will respect my son. You see, if you understand the story I've just told, then that's going to take you a long way towards understanding this parable. How have you responded to the claim of God's son on your life? Now, often in Jesus' teaching, particularly his parables, he was criticized for being obscure. People didn't really understand what he was talking about. Even the disciples often had to get the Lord aside and ask him, now, Lord, explain to us this parable. But notice, not this time. The message came through loud and clear. Everybody, particularly the religious leaders, understood exactly what Jesus was trying to say. Now, the setting of this story is in a vineyard. And if we could use some sanctified imagination to join the lookout in the vineyard's watchtower, this is what we would see. Row after row of healthy vines, grapes glistening in the sun. We see that the vineyard is well fortified, a high wall around the perimeter. There is an excavated wine pit, one end lower than the other, so the juice could flow from the grapes down and be collected. As we talk to the tenants, the farmers, we find they're very proud of the vineyard. 
Uh, the owner is away. He, he's an absentee landowner. That, that was a very common practice in biblical Palestine. Now, legally, the vineyard is the owner's, but as we talk to the farmers, we sense a different attitude. After all, they say, we're, we're the ones who work at it. Uh, we have to tend to this vineyard. It, it's really not fair for the owner to demand so much. that This really should be our vineyard. Now, the watchtower that we have joined ourselves to is a sentry post. Suddenly a report comes, a, a solitary figure is approaching the gate. We see a look of alarm, then identification among the farmers. It's one of the owner's servants can't come to claim his share of the vineyard. There's a hurried conference, a plan of action, an increasing rebellion against the owner's claim to the vineyard. Let's beat this man and send him away empty-handed. Another servant comes. This one they, they wound and treat shamelessly. Finally, they kill. Some they beat and some they kill, the parable says. They've gone too far now to stop. Let's finish them all off and the vineyard really will be ours. The day of treachery ends with a celebration. But then there's an abrupt halt. From the watchtower, once again, there's a warning. A, a solitary figure is approaching the gate. Who could it be? As the uh, farmers stare down the road, suddenly a chill comes over them. It, it's, it's the owner coming. No, no, it's too young for the owner. It's the owner's son. And as he enters the vineyard, he's greeted with fear and resentment. A horrible realization hits them all. That's it. That's the ticket. Let's kill the sun. And the vineyard is ours forever. No one need know. We'll kill him and bury his body outside the vineyard. One last evil act to claim the vineyard and deny the claim of the rightful owner. Now our mental visit helps us feel the impact of this parable that Jesus told during the last week of his life. Uh, no one missed the meaning, not even the religious leaders who missed most of what he said. In fact, it says in verse 12 that they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. Uh, everybody knew that when Jesus talked about a vineyard, that symbolized Israel. That was his automatic association to people at that time as the eagle and Uncle Sam and the color of the American flags. We, we know what people are talking about. The words of scripture like Isaiah 5, 7 had been engraved on the hearts of people. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are the garden of his life. The characters in the story, they're easy to figure out. The landowner who seems to be absent is none other than God. The servants who keep coming are the prophets that God has sent down through the ages. The farmers are the tenants, are the religious leaders, and in a sense, uh, they represent all the people. And the son, the only son, is Jesus about to die. Really, you have here the whole story of the Old and the New Testament in capsule form. You see, the leaders were just as defensive and possessive of their religious turf as the farmers. Jesus had entered into their Jerusalem, their territory. They were not about to advocate to his claims no matter who he claimed to be. Let's crucify him, end his presumptuous claims, and then we can get back to business as usual. And that's exactly what they did. But now let's shift the image and let's personalize this parable. What about the vineyard of your life? Who has the right of ownership there? Have you welcomed God's son as the rightful owner? What if we built a wall around and said to God, hands off, this is mine. 
What areas are we under our own self-management? You see, the real issue, who's, who's really in charge? Who is in control? Who's driving the vehicle? When and where have we rejected God's message and messengers? Oh, there's some good indicators who really owns the vineyard of your life. How you spend your money is one way. You can consider where most of your time and energy goes. Who or what comes first in your life? You see, Jesus wanted us to see our own attitudes towards the claims of God in our life are closer to the attitude of the farmers towards the owner than we'd like to admit. Indifference and planned neglect of God's claim is just as bad as open hostility. How have we responded to God's claim of ownership? Haven't we all tried to deny his claims, whether it be in the area of our money, time, family, priorities, thinking, commitments, or a dozen other ways we could name? Now, the owner provided the vineyard. But somehow the thinking of the farmers had become twisted. They somehow now thought what the owner had entrusted and given them should be theirs alone. I wonder, has a transition from God to ours to just mine ever taken place in your life? We so easily lose the perspective of commitment and stewardship to the degree that no one not even God has the right to tell us what to do. A preacher, one Sunday in his Sunday morning sermon, his message was on God's ownership. Uh, there was a man in the congregation, uh, the wealthiest man there, a man who owned a large plantation. And what the preacher said really bothered him. And so as soon as the service, he said, Preacher, if you don't have another invitation, I want you to come to my home and, and eat with us today. I want to talk to you. And the preacher agreed. After they'd had the, the meal, uh, the man took the, the preacher out and he said, I want you to look to the east and the west and the north and the south, every direction. And preacher, I want you to know that as far as you can see, all that you see is mine. It has belonged to my family for many generations. But if I understood what you were saying in your sermon this morning... You were saying this land is really not mine. It belongs to God. Is that true? The preacher had inspiration from the Holy Spirit and he looked at the man and he said, I tell you what, ask me that question a hundred years from now and we'll see who the land belongs to. Oh, I tell you, the little words, my and mine, can grow to dangerous proportions in our life, and soon the Lord is dealt out of our daily routine. We are effectively under our own self-management. We take our vineyard over, and we leave God outside. But notice in the parable, the owner kept sending servants. In that, we see the patience and persistence of a gracious God. Uh, now, you know, we all have our, our little portable laptops and, and really our, our cell phones, uh, and, and they have all this computer power. But when computers were, were first coming on the scene, I mean, they were huge things. You, you had to have a big room to have a computer. Uh, one of the first magazines that that went com, uh, that computerized their their uh, uh, subscriber list was the National Geographic. They had one of those great big old computers. One day there was a malfunction and the whirling and the spinning, uh, and it spit out nine thousand nine hundred and ninety seven renewal subscriptions, all to the same old sheep herder in Montana. Uh, that old guy was out in his field when the mail truck pulled up uh, and the mailman pulled out three bulging bags. The sheep rancher started reading them. He read about a hundred, realized they all said the same thing, hopped in his pickup truck, dro drove 30 miles to the nearest town that had a Western Union office and he wired National Geographic and said this, I give up. 
renew my uh, subscription. Listen, God has gone to even greater lengths than that. Oh, how shocked and hurt the owner must have been. But the scripture says, finally, he decided to send his only son. He, he took the ultimate chance. Now, now, in real life, an owner would have acted much differently. Uh, he would have brought all the force of, of, of law uh, and power he could. But you see, Jesus is revealing a God who loves beyond measure and is compassionate when he has every reason to be sincere. Severe. I, I love how the message reads part of this parable Starting with verse 6, it says this. Finally, there was only one left, a beloved son. In a last-ditch effort, he sent him thinking, surely they will respect my son. But those farmhands saw their chance. They rubbed their hands together in greed and said, this is the heir, let's kill him and have it all for ourselves. They grabbed him, killed him, and threw him over the fence. Why did Jesus tell this as his last parable right before the cross? I think this is an appeal to God's love. God's son in the flesh to press home God's claim. Now, tragically, his plea was understood but still rejected. For you see, that's what sin is. Sin is taking over the vineyard. Sin is leaving God out. Sin is rejecting God's love in Jesus. The parable ends on a tragic note. At least it seems to. But then again, I want to submit to you that this is really an unfinished parable in terms of the whole gospel. To complete it, we're going to have to go back to the vineyard. A surprise awaits. Another figure is approaching the gate of the vineyard. Who could it be? The servants have all been vanquished. The son is dead. But we see, we can tell by the wounds on his head and in his feet and in his hands. It's the son and he has returned with the mark of ownership. For you see, resurrection is the last word. He comes and his claim is greater than before. His claim has doubled. In a small mountain village, people lived in very simple buildings, basically thatched huts. And one evening in the middle of the night, one of the little huts caught on fire. It was engulfed. Uh, within that home, there was a mother and father and their two small children. Uh, there was no firefighting equipment. It was just a little rural village. Uh, the people gathered around helplessly. It looked like the whole family was about to be lost when suddenly, out of the group, a young man rushed forward. His name was Andy. He pushed through the burning door and into the home. And just before the house collapsed, Andy came running out with the two children, one tucked under each arm. The children were safe and saved. Andy had terribly burned his hands in the rescue effort and had to receive uh, some help to heal. Meanwhile, uh, the villagers tried to decide what to do with the two small children. Uh, there were no living family that they knew about. Uh, the village elders decided that on a certain day they would have a meeting and they would see if anybody would claim the children. On that day, there were two claimants. One was the village squire, uh, perhaps the wealthiest man in the village. He could offer the children some advantages. But the other claimant was none other than Andy himself. And when the elders ask Andy, by what right do you think you can claim the children? Andy didn't say anything. He just simply held up his hands that had been so burned and scarred in rescuing the children. Listen, Jesus has the rightful claim. It was validated on the cross. It was proved in the resurrection. And this helps us understand 
the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament that Jesus quotes in verse 10 and 11. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This Jesus of Nazareth, who had been crucified, rejected, treated as a criminal, an outcast is now revealed as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I close with this story. Dr. George Harley was a wonderful Methodist layperson. He, he was a, a doctor. He lived in North Carolina, but he felt the call to be a missionary. His uh, missionary work was in the country of Liberia uh, to a group uh, of native people called the Mano people. Uh, there, uh, out of his legacy, came a great hospital, the Ganta Hospital, that is still in operation today. George Harley was a brilliant man. Uh, he not only had a medical degree, he had five earned degrees but he left his thriving medical practice in North Carolina at the call of God to go to Africa. Uh, his wife, Winfred, went with him. At the time, she was seven and a half months pregnant. They went as far as any road would take them, and they kept walking until they came to a large bend in a river. There, Dr. Harley proceeded pretty much by his own efforts to build a small clinic, a little chapel, a school. Meanwhile, uh, their uh, son, who had been uh, born soon after arriving, Robert, little Robert, was now three years old. Little Robert got a tropical disease. It made him dizzy. He was crawling on some rocks, and his father watched in horror as Robert got dizzy and fell and hit his head. He rushed out. He said, I I've got all these degrees. Uh, surely I can save my son. But George Harley said, I couldn't save my son. I watched my little boy die in Africa some 8,000 miles from our home in North Carolina. <clears throat> George Harley said he found a little box to put his son in, lifted it on his shoulder and started walking down through the village to the soft sand near the river where he was going to bury little Robert. As he went by what would be the equivalent of the village blacksmith, uh, the, the man said, what are you doing? And he said, my son has died. I'm going to bury him. Uh, the blacksmith said, I'll, I'll help you. One of the first offers of help George Harley had got from the natives. They got to the place where George Harley dug the grave and lowered the little box with his son in there and he thought I, I should try to say something. But George Harley said, I, I couldn't. All I could do was cry. He said, suddenly, I heard this old native begin to shout and run towards the village, crying out, great father, doctor, he cry like one of us. He cry like one of us. George Harley said, a miracle happened. That next Sunday, following his son's death, when they opened the door to the little chapel, almost every villager was there. And that followed every Sunday as many and most of the village became Christians. And even today, there is a great Christian presence among the Mano uh, people that will hearken all the way back to George Harley Dr. Harley retired as a missionary after 37 years. He returned back to the United States. He shared his testimony many times. It was a wonderful story. And he says that after one of the times he shared, somebody came up to him and said, oh, Dr. Harley, that, that, that was so wonderful, so inspiring, but something really bothers me. It bothers me that you had to give your son to get through 
to those people. George Harley said, yes, I had to pay a great price. But remember, that's what God had to do too. That's what God had to do too. Oh, listen, I'm here as God's messenger to tell you once again about the claims of God's Son. Uh, the Christ is here to proclaim His Lordship over our lives, families, relationships, you name it. There is no failure, sin, or arrogant demand to run the vineyard that He will not forgive. The living, resurrected Lord is returned to seek entrance to the vineyard of our life. God gave His beloved Son to break through to us at great cost. The cross is his claim of ownership. Have you accepted his claim of ownership by making Jesus your Lord, the owner of your life? This is a new chance to invite him in and say, Lord, my life belongs to you. Forgive me for being under self-management for so long. Take control of what is rightfully yours, Lord. I accept your love and offer friendship to work together. Who really owns your vineyard? God loved us enough to take a great chance. I will send my beloved son. Surely they will respect him Well, will you? Have you done that? It's all about what we do or don't do with God's Son and how we respond to His claim. Disregard the Son and you miss it all. Take the Son and all the Father has is included to be shared together and the Christ is here to claim you and me. Will you, have you accepted his claim? May God add his blessings to his word. Amen. Mm -hmm.